Here we go. Hey, welcome back, Con Con. Thanks for uh, listening to us uh, shoot uh, the crap. Right now, you have Dr. Mark Carney. He's a technical specialist in research, and he's going to give you a great talk on tears for quantum fears. Uh, see you guys after. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you very much. So, yes, my name is Mark Carney. Bank of England. Uh, I am very glad to be presenting a quick kind of uh, overview of quantum and security. So we're going to look at what quantum means and how it relates to security. What, what do you need to know? The idea is here not to give a condensed lecture series with just slides of mathematics. There is one math slide. Sorry. No, actually, no, I'm not sorry. You know, just I'm sorry for my lack of apology. There you go. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of present uh, today uh, this this particular talk now with added kittens. Um, so we're going to sort of go through what is quantum, and then we're going to look at the way in which it's going to be affecting security. And it's kind of like if you listen to quantum people too much, uh, they'll say things like the wind is coming. It is already blowing. And that's kind of like, yeah, that's not very helpful. Um, what we need is actual facts and figures and a way of looking at this quite critically. So that's what we're going to do today. Just facts, resources, links, there's QR codes. So if you have a mobile phone or a tablet, get that ready because that'll be uh, best of you, some of the links. So, you know, what is a quantum anyway? If you ask Google, you'll hear one of a few things. Okay, you'll find that quantum is dishwasher powder. Finish Powerball, Quantum Ultimate. Sounds very, very sort of, you know, sort of powerful, you know, the Quantum Ultimate. Um, it's also beer. The Quantum State uh, is a beer, is a 4.2% session IPA. I think they sell this at Asda, which is our version of Walmart. Um, then there's Sure for Men, Motion Sense, Quantum Dry. For your man who's a photon in the streets and a boson in the sheets. Um, and that might lead to needing a Quantum Buggy. Quantum pram. Yes, genuinely, there are prams marketed as quantum. And my favorite is toilet roll, bog roll, loo roll, toilet paper. Um, yeah, seriously, quantum is everywhere. It's a bit of a buzzword. What does it actually mean? So quantum means just this. It's the smallest finite piece of something. I did check. Quantum toilet roll, they do not sell you the smallest finite piece of toilet roll. Don't ask how I checked. That experiment is between me and me alone. So quantum effects are what you're seeing. When someone says we're going to use a quantum technology, they're talking about quantum effects. And there's generally two that they're talking about, okay? Superposition and entanglement. Now, superposition is when a particle is in multiple states simultaneously. And I'm going to give you kind of a sense of what that really means, okay? And then entanglement has a lot of quantum woo about it. But realistically, two particles can in a sense, become inseparable. And actually, the in a sense bit's really important there. There's a mathematical thing. The, the polynomials are inseparable, for those who care. Um, it, and, and they are linked in such a way that if you measure one, you know some information about the other. Okay? So that's all entanglement really means. That's all superposition really means. And they're kind of very, very useful effects, but they only really happen at the quantum level. We just don't see them at the macro level where we live and breathe and talk to each other. So we, we, I could go at length about what these are, but I'm not going to. I'm not really going to touch on entanglement at all. Superposition will become relevant, but realistically, when you hear quantum technology, you're usually dealing with one of these two or possibly a similar technology, which is kind of related to the like wave particle duality or something. Um, so what I, if there's only one slide you look at, let it be this one. Okay, uh, there are four domains of effect that you're going to see for quantum when it comes to security. The first thing you're going to see is quantum computing. Quantum computing does pose somewhat of a threat, theoretically at least, to classical cryptography. Then you're going to see post-quantum cryptography, which is basically uh, a cryptography that doesn't rely on the same hardness problem that regular cryptography has for the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and we're going to sort of look, why do we care? Why does NIST care about it? We're also going to look at quantum key distribution, which is where you use quantum effects to actually derive a key and do key exchange. And lastly, we're going to have a very quick look at some quantum, quantum algorithms to show how actually 
maybe we can use these like in our day-to-day -day, uh, work uh, to gain benefit from quantum computers and their capabilities. So um, this is the first one. If you want to have a look, please scan that QR code. I'll give people a second. I will also put the link uh, in the Discord afterwards, uh, but someone's probably got a faster fingers than I have. Um, so it's just a GeoGebra, just to sort of demonstrate what's going on, okay? I'm going to assume you can see this. If not, I, uh, I guess Kwon 2 will tell me. Um, so this is how we usually think about uh, 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 bits, okay? You have either an up going towards a zero, or you're in an one state, and you're never in both. You're always in one or the other, okay? So you have two states for one bit, and then you have four states between two bits, and then you have eight states between three bits, and it just keeps multiplying up in powers of two from there, right? Now, that's absolutely fine, um, and we use that as inspiration uh, when it comes to quantum bits. So a qubit has a very similar structure. Now we change the notation, you'll see things like this. This is a zero with like a funny line and a right angle bracket here. Um, that's called a ket. Um, the, if it points the other way, it's called a bra. Bra and ket. Um, for those of you realizing, yes, that's why Amazon called their quantum service bra ket. Um, so yeah, if it's pointing down here, it's going to be in the one state. So the ket being state, so there's a zero state and the one state. And again, we can be sort of either or, okay? Or, you know what, we could be, I don't know, somewhere in a 3D plane, okay? Now, when you're in this 3D plane, you can actually say, well, we're going to have, um, you know, some other vector and some other point. And actually, there's a whole infinitude of points. They lie on a, on a sphere like this, okay? So when you're dealing with a qubit, this is probably the best picture to have. This point can be all the way up at zero, okay? Or it can be all the way down um, in one. But it can also be, for example, exactly halfway in between. And this is superposition, because it's neither in zero or one. It's exactly halfway. And that's superposition of, of these particular states, okay? So when you talk here about sort of the magic of qubits, the magic of quantum, this is the picture that I'd like you to have in your mind, okay? This is the kind of model that you're going to be using, okay? So you, you don't just have zero or one, you have a zero and a one, and then you have this kind of sphere of possibilities uh, that you can use on top of that, okay? Now, uh, have a play with that. The GeoGebra is online. I'll put the link in the Discord if someone uh, doesn't beat me to it. Um, and there's the, there's the link again on the QR code if you want to be quick. So now that we've gone through that, that's kind of the overall model. That's the fundamental kind of model that you deal with with a qubit, okay? Um, at least that's the one that most people talk about. So we're going to have a very quick, very fast quantum computation class zero. We're not going to go into any details. I'm just going to give you the shape for those who care of what the maths kind of looks like. And it's very difficult to not have maths in a talk about quantum computing, right? Because we haven't yet got the abstraction layers. Quantum computers are very close to ZX80s, okay? You have to understand the very low level of what's going on in order to really program and make, make it do things. So what's the model? Well, a qubit, a quantum bit, is a computing unit that can be some combination of zero state and one state, not just one or the other. It could be somewhere in between as well. Mathematically, it looks like this. Two lines of math, that's all. Um, so you get an alpha and beta. These are complex numbers. So when you saw this sphere earlier, what, two of those axes were real. One was imaginary. Okay? And you have a rule. Alpha squared plus beta squared must equal to one, because otherwise it doesn't sit on the sphere, basically. Um, and then you can express the states as follows. The zero state is the pointing up state, the one zero state. The one state is the pointing down state, the zero one state. And so some state psi is a combination of those two, right? So you can write, rewrite this as a, as a vector of alpha at the top and beta on the bottom. So with that in mind, the model is called the block sphere, spelt this way, for those who want to go and have a look. But you don't really need to understand that. All you need to see is that there's little two-place vectors, and then you need to know how to actually interact with them. So classically, a classical computer is a sequence of gates. Okay, and, or, nand, nor, xor, we're all very, very familiar with those. So logic gates form regular computers. Well, quantum gates form quantum computers. And quantum gates are two by two matrices to match with the two place vectors. Okay, and then for every qubit you add, uh, you, you get the next power of two size matrix being uh, uh, in play. And that's all that happens. You string the various matrices together, and what you get is what's called a quantum circuit, and that's your quantum algorithm. 
So you'll see these kinds of line diagrams, and those are quantum circuits. Okay, now a brief, brief break. It's fine. It's fine. These are your post math kittens to make sure we can get everyone through. All right, um, little kid, little, little one in the middle. I'm not going to let naughty Uncle Schrodinger near you. So. Um, what do these circuits look like? Well, they look like this. So this is a circuit. It's got three uh, qubits here, and it's got a classical register at the bottom. It's th three bits wide, but it doesn't really matter. Um, we assume that they are always in the zero reset state um, until we sort of manipulate them with gates. So the first gate is a Pauli X. That turns it from a zero to a one. That's what that does. The Hadamard gate, the H little box, is the superposition gate. So you put it into one, and then you put it into superposition from there, okay? And that's different from putting it into superposition from a zero. And then you have interesting gates like this. So this is the controlled not gate. So this is a not if and only if the upper bit is a one. So if this is a one, then whatever goes in here is, is not the output, okay? And then if this is a zero, it's a straight through, okay? And that's quite straightforward. Why do we need this? Turns out a C knot, a controlled knot, which is what this is, um, is actually an entangler and detangler. Kind of useful. So you just build these out into a quantum algorithm. You'll get something like this. The little black boxes are measurements. So you, we measure qubit zero, and we measure qubit one, and then we measure qubit two, and we put the answer into the register. Okay. Now, this circuit has a very fancy name. It's called the quantum teleporter. Very Star Trek. So what this does is it just teleports the state of qubit one into the state of qubit two, um, even if you don't know what the state in Q1 is. So I said that the X sets it to one. So you would expect then to see the one moved over into the most significant bit of the output. And if you measure it, that's what you see. This is what it looks like. It might look suspiciously like Python. That's because it is. This is all run from a Python notebook. Uh, this is a QASM simulator. Um, how did I come up with these? How did I learn what to do? Well, I looked at the IBM quantum experience. This is what it looks like. In fact, I can actually show you messing around with a little circuit. So it's drag and drop. I want to add a qubit, I press a button. It's really straightforward. I can just go through, uh, add some qubits. Oh, I don't I like the way this one's arranged, so I can rearrange it like that. And if you know what you're doing, this is quite straightforward. And then I can just go, okay, I want a measurement there, and I want a measurement there. I can always check the phase here, and I can look up here how many times I want to run it, which computer do I want to use, and just go run. You'll also note here, there's a thing called QASM. There's a quantum assembly language, okay? It's not as complex as CISC from x86, uh, nowhere near. In fact, it's not really as complicated as, uh, uh, as ARM. But... It does exist, and it lets you describe the circuits as sequences of gates, okay? So kind of the theory of quantum computing is growing, and it's only going to kind of get more and more. So like showing people and exposing people to this is, I think, entirely useful and appropriate, especially with quantum computing not necessarily being a million miles away. We're going to come to exactly what I mean by that um, in a minute. So let's just look at some resources. I'm not going to go on any further about this. I'm just going to show you um, some resources. So the first resource is Qiskit. Qiskit is a really easy to use, very well documented uh, quantum circuit uh, uh, library for Python. It plugs directly into the IBM quantum experience. So you can use the UI or you can just use the API from a Jupyter notebook. And it just works. It just connects up. You give it the API token, which you can sign up for free, and you can just go and start running quantum circuits. In fact, if you get really bored in this talk, you can have a play with that. It's a, you know, it's, it's kind of fun, I think. Then again, I'm that kind of person. So once you've sort of made a few circuits and had a, had a bit of a play, you might want to go, oh, I want some more algorithms. Well, one resource is called Quantiki, which I'm not going to lie, sounds like a cocktail. In fact, actually, maybe I should go, like, can we go into like a DEF CON? I want a selfie with Jack Daniel holding a Quantiki. We need to make that happen somehow. I'll have a think about that. Anyway, um, you might go to Quantiki first. Quantiki is a little bit easier to read. Uh, Quantum Algorithm Zoo is more comprehensive, I think, but um, it's kind of written by postgraduate physics students for postgraduate physics students. So you might not understand everything everywhere because there's, it, it's still mostly physicists doing this. Okay, I'm a mathematician by training. Um, that's what my PhD is in. Uh, so I'm looking at this and I'm like, that physics? That's physics, okay. Because they do weird things like this, sort of, they've got these, these equations and they go, and this bit doesn't matter. And I'm like, doesn't it? You can't just do that. 
turns out you can. And there's good reasons for it. It's how they sort of rationalize uh, uh, the maths that sort of makes the physics and the physical world make sense for us. But these are, these are some good resources. If you want to actually look at uh, uh, some quantum computing resources, there's loads out there. The three that I'm going to mention here, the IBM Quantum Experience, I've already mentioned. Um, likewise, there's also D-Wave Leap. Um, now, D-Wave is different. D-Wave is a thing called a quantum annealing machine, which is different from the IBM quantum experience quantum computer. I won't say how or why or what is different, but you'll notice differences. Um, and the last one is, uh, it's look at Azure Quantum. I mean, I'd love to talk about them. I've been trying to email them for six weeks. If anyone knows anyone at Azure Quantum, do let me know, because it's like, I'd love to just, just get some more documentation and ask some questions, but they're like, it's like, it's like trying to contact monks. Um, so let's get back to security, which is why we're all here. What breaks and how? Shaw's algorithm. What does it do? It takes a number and it finds its prime factors. Now you can write a program to do that. In Python, it's a few lines, right? The difference is your Python program will take exponentially long to run compared to, uh, you know, sort of the, the act of actually just finding the number by multiplying two numbers together. What do I mean? Take the numbers two and 60. Multiply those together, you get 120. But if you want to find out which two numbers I had to multiply together to get 120, you have seven pairs, excluding 120 and one. You've got seven pairs, so 14 numbers to choose from and find, right? And that, that's why it's a hard problem. As the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, the number of factors also gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so much so that we, we, we know that it's a very, very hard problem, MP hard problem to actually factor prime, uh, factor numbers and see if, and find their primes, uh, the primes that make them up. Now, quantum computers can factor numbers in sub-exponential time, and that's why it's a thing. That's why people are losing their heads, okay? It's bad because we rely on factoring to be hard. If factoring is no longer hard, RSA and ECC immediately start to have problems, okay? Likewise, Grover's algorithm poses problems to uh, basically any symmetric cipher um, because what it does is it lets you do a dictionary search or a database search that it has n many entries and it lets you do it in square root of n many tries. What does that really mean? Well, square root is taking a thing to the exponent of one half. If you don't believe me, I mean, have a go. So if you take the key length and halve it, that's the effective length. Now, it's not actually quite that simple. There's a lot of nuance and detail, which I am skipping way over. But for the purposes of general intuition, Take the key length, halve it. So AES128 becomes AES64, or DES, as you might want to call it. Uh, AES256 becomes AES128. Now, AES128 is still very secure. It's still got 128 bits of security inside it. But, you know, it, 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 you still have this problem, okay? It doesn't sort of go away, okay? If you listen to crypto bros, they just go quantum. And that's it. End of talk. And it's like, no, there's more to it than that. What can we do about it? There's quite a few things we can do about it. So Shaw's algorithm is going to take roughly seven years to really sort of work, to be workable on a quantum computer. This is making assumptions. The assumptions are that we're going to double the number of qubits in a single machine every year, and we're going to have lots and lots and lots of stability. So at the moment, a qubit is stable for, I think the longest is a millisecond, no, a microsecond. Um, however, you would need orders of days and weeks potentially. So there's a lot of engineering and magic and plumbing and, you know, sort of absolute wizardry that has to happen before these things come about. Seven years for Shaw's algorithm, eight years based on estimates for Grover's algorithm to become workable against say AES-256, right? If you look at MIT's most efficient algorithm, which runs in a few hours, still needs 20 million qubits, right? So like this is, you know, sort of seven to 15 years, eight to 18 years potentially uh, away. And that's making grand assumptions, okay? Now NIST's project is going to come, come live, but there's things you can do in the short term. First of all, you can use longer keys. If this is a genuine threat, if you're actually caring about this, then use longer keys, all right? Um, 496 bit for RSA, use ECC with P384, um, upgrade to AES256 as much as possible, and also use AES in GCM mode. 
Galois counter mode is really kind of nifty. It's got that lovely Galois feel, which gives that nice auth tag. It makes it more complicated. Doesn't make it quantum resist more quantum resistant in in the sense of algorithms, but it does make it like you've got to have more qubits. You've got to do more work. Okay, so just make it harder the way that you usually do when you want to make things sort of uh, more secure. You, you you start off by making things more difficult. Ultimately, we're really going to rely on NIST making their mind up at some point about post quantum cryptography. Now, um, NIST are on their way, okay, and we're going to have a little look at what's going on with uh, post quantum cryptography. Um, they have currently sort of uh, got it down to round three, okay. So let's just have a little look at what's going on. So, classical crypto with its algorithms that are vulnerable to quantum algorithms. Oh, no, 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 we don't want that. We want post quantum cryptography, my friend. That is the way forward, okay. What does it mean? It means this. It's cryptography that doesn't rely on number factoring, a thing we know quantum computers are really good at. It doesn't rely on that problem for its security. That's all it really means, okay? So there's several different schemes out there. The finalists are these. So lattice-based crypto, super singular isogenies on elliptic curves. That's going to get you a good score at Scrabble. Um, and there's some hashing algorithms as well. So let's look at what's going on okay so this is a very bare bones example if you want more uh link at the bottom is a summer school slides which are really good these are taken from those slides okay verbatim not quite but near enough um where we're just going to look at a, an old problem where we know the solution and then we can modulate it to make it that we don't have a solution and also we don't think quantum computers do either right so here's what happens you have an array of numbers and then you have a secret and you multiply that secret down and then take the answer mod 13, okay? Now, if you did a linear algebra course at high school, which by the way is all you really need mathematically to do a lot of quantum stuff, then you'll know that this isn't secure. There's a thing called Gaussian uh, elimination, uh, which is a very straightforward algorithm that actually lets you easily work out what the secret is, okay? If I know the random array and the output, can very straightforward work out what's going on in the middle, okay? However, I can make it more difficult if I do this. If I add a little bit of noise, there's two bits of noise. The first bit is whether it's a zero or a one, and the second bit is whether it's adding or taking away. And there's a confusion with two of the bits because if you add zero or take away zero, then you know it's the same thing, right? So you've got this little bit of noise that doesn't get recorded, it just gets used in this calculation. So here you can see that all the numbers on the right in the output have kind of modulated just a little bit. So the problem, so this is called, with, uh, this is the with errors bit of learning with errors, okay? This random noise skews everything just a little bit. But of course, over very large arrays and very large numbers and lots and lots of iterations, that error grows and grows and grows. So actually the problem becomes this, given the random array and the output, which by the way is what forms your public key for learning with errors and a similar thing for ring learning with errors, the difference being that you don't store the whole array, the array is made up of rotational permutations of like various rows. Um, given an array and given an output and facts you know about it, like it's modulo 13, find the red thing, okay, find the secret. And that's actually really, really hard. We know it's hard because it's the same problem as this. If I put a blue dot in the middle, okay, and then I have this lovely lattice array, so I have all these lovely parallel vectors here and these lovely parallel vectors going this way, then if I put a dot in the middle, what's the shortest, what's the nearest valid point to that dot? Now, in two dimensions, it doesn't look particularly difficult. But as you put more and more and more dimensions on this, as your arrays get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? That problem gets exponentially hard. And the important point is this, there is no known quantum algorithmic speed up for this problem, okay? And that, my friends, is what makes it post-quantum, okay? We haven't used number factoring anywhere. And okay, you might say, but how does it know if it's a one or a zero when the error term is not is thrown away? Because what you get is you get like 0 0.012 or you get 0 0.998. So you get numbers that are very close to one and very close to zero and you go close enough, close enough, close enough, close enough, close enough. And you get the right answer out the other end. If you try and do it any other way, you get nonsense, which is kind of the idea of cryptography. So we know it works. But we don't know yet whether NIST think that it works well enough for it to be used uh, uh, widespread.
So when will this be commonplace? Well, currently the candidates just, so they're here again. And by the way, yes, it is a hashing algorithm called Crystal's Dilithium. Okay, just in case you're wondering, that's the actual name. Um, there's these which are set out. So Psych, I think is from Microsoft with AWS, well, I know AWS, I think, support it. Um, NTRU comes out of, I can't, I can't remember where it comes out of, I'll have to double check that. I'm sure someone in the chat somewhere will correct me. Um, but like these things have all been submitted. These are the main eight, and then what you're gonna have as well is lots of backups. So you, I think you've got like 13 or 15 backups waiting in the wings, because as they've, they started with a huge list of them, and gradually they've worked out, this isn't as strong as we thought, this is a problem over here. Someone finds a new attack against the crypto system, and then they sort of take it out of the running. So what's left should be pretty good. Now, we're into round three, we can expect more attacks to come about, we can expect more writing to come about. We don't even know what it's gonna be called though. I don't even know if NIST know what it's gonna be called. We had DES and AES, and that was like, we're gonna choose one. I don't think we're going to get one. I think we're going to have in around two years, we're going to have multiple ciphers with lots of notes and requirements and considerations and recommendations and estimations and all manner of different key lengths. Okay. I, I think it's a mistake to say that NIST are going to go, here is the solution. I think that genuinely it's going to be, so here's what we've ended up with. And we're just going to have to make sense of it somehow the way that we obviously have done in every other area of security. Again, I make every apology for my lack of apology for the maths, but here's a little math cut with a little mew. Just gonna leave that there. But I'm a mathematician, okay? The comedy is a bonus, all right? Okay, so quantum key distribution is the next kind of topic. I'm not gonna to go too much in depth. All I'm gonna do is say that in 1984, uh, Bennett and Brassar worked out a way of using quantum effects to make a provably secure quantum key exchange mechanism, okay? So this became known as BB84, okay? And then there was a subsequent system called Eckert 91 or E91. And then after that, there's been loads ever since, all kind of modulations and changes, Bipiadad and all these other things. Um, and these are in use. There are companies that uh, produce these systems. In fact, BT and Toshiba announced just yesterday that they were building the UK's first quantum secure industrial network between key UK smart production facilities. So what are they doing? Well, here's a kind of a rough thing. This paper, by the way, at the bottom is really good. It's a little bit physics and mathsy at times, but it's actually the bits that you that are quite readable are worth having a look at if this if you this tickles your fancy and you're a little bit curious. So here's what happens. Alice chooses some basis, left, right, up, down, diagonal, or the other diagonal, right? And then polarizes a photon and then sends that down a fiber. That goes round and it ends up in Bob's inbox or Bob's input port, right? Bob then chooses either the up, down, left, right basis or the 45 degree rotated basis and then does a measurement. And then they swap information. So alongside the fiber line, you've also got a lot of quantum, uh, sorry, a lot of classical channels as well, okay? Where you're constantly swapping information. I'm about to send a bit. Here's what I did. Here's all these things. There's a lot of error correction that happens as well because quantum systems are very prone to error. Um, and then once you go through everything, you can see that, uh, you know, where they match up in the bottom there, um, Bob mismeasures the wrong basis. So he, there's a zero at the end. Then Bob gets it right. So there's a one. Then Bob gets it wrong. But here he measures a one instead. And so you get this kind of output here. And then once you've gone through it enough times, um, the output is, the reason for that one, by the way, is um, some positional. Um, once you've gone through it enough times, then you have enough information to be able to say, ah, okay, this is the key and we know we have a secret, okay? I mentioned the error term. If there's someone listening on the line, then that error term will rise. And that's how you know if there's an Eve on the line. It's called the beta term in the mathematics. And that's how you measure it. So you can actually work out, oh, we think there's an Eve there. We're going to go and do something else or we're going to start again. So these algorithms are quite sort of quite quite nifty there's a lot of interesting stuff going on but if it's from the mid 80s you might say well why isn't it everywhere then well, remember i said you have to have a fiber line between alice and bob now let me walk you through some facts about qkd which often aren't talked about the mathematics that makes regular crypto secure doesn't care about the channel it's communicated over whereas the mathematics that makes quantum systems secure they, they, they do care 
okay? Because it's part of the system. So what you get out of the end is that you, you can't packet switch photons without measuring them, all right? Now, um, I did a, 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 lot of, a lot of discussion in a, uh, an article in Forbes by, uh, with Davey Winder and a few others um, to talk about loft orbital. And, you know, they're using space, which is great, you know, sort of, yeah, space, rockets, brilliant. Um, all the things, quantum, space, oh my God. Um, but ultimately, like, sort of, there's problems. Like, if it's cloudy, you can't do key exchange. You can't. Also, you can't control atmospheric dispersion and diffusion uh, and diffraction. You can't. That's just just happens. No matter how narrow your laser beam is, it happens. So uh, if you want to have a look, there's a QR code uh, to the link, or you can just search for the Meet the Scrappy Space Startup. Love that. Really nice bit of uh, <laughs> bit of headlinemanship there. Um, companies that make QKD systems include a company called ID Quantique. Uh, based in Switzerland. They're, they've been doing since like 2001. They've, they've got a lot of expertise around this. Magic, with a Q, um, have been around for a while as well, and Toshiba have been in this space for some time. If you want to kind of scare a QKD vendor, though, ask them how their tech works with cloud-based infrastructure. Just ask. I'll say no more. Now, you might say, I want to hack this. Wouldn't it be cool to do it, to be a quantum hacker? It would be brilliant. It's you know absolutely fantastic. However, you wouldn't be the first. Back in 2011, uh, Lars Leiderson and, and, uh, and company found that you could shine a very bright laser beam down the fiber and then work out by the reflection what the phase was, uh, what the measurement phase that Bob was using was. So actually, um, you find that uh, you know you can actually get all these little side channels and, and, and hacks. The original QKD system from the 80s, you didn't need to be Eve. You just listened for which optics were being switched in and out because they all made different sounds. So if you were in the lab, you could easily work out what the key was, you know? Um, there's stuff like injection locking uh, and Trojan states being put in through various sort of laser modulation patterns and laser frequencies. It's absolutely fascinating. There was, these slides will be online afterwards, so don't worry about scribbling them down now. But there's some really interesting stuff out there. And the kind of the last point in my final few minutes, I'm going to talk about like sort of quantum algorithms. Okay. I've talked about quantum computers. Surely there's more to it than just, you know, breaking, factoring big numbers for TLAs. Like surely there's more to life than that. And there is. Quantum finance is a thing. Doing, you know, sort of uh, stock market uh, modeling and pricing on a quantum computer is an active area of study. Okay. Quantum chemistry simulations. I mean, you've got a quantum system so that you can control every part of it. So can you simulate molecules, for example? And the answer is yes. Like Google released a, a thing last uh, last week or month, I think I think it was, where they said, yes, we're going to actually, uh, you know, state the claim that we've we've simulated. Um, I think what, what was it salt? I can't remember. Um, but like, so you know, these are really growing areas of of research and uh, and, and innovation. What about quantum random number generator? Because I've mentioned that like, quantum is a really good source of randomness. So. Why don't we actually go, well, can we see the CSPRNG, cryptographically secure pseudo random number generator of quantum? Well, yes. So what I'm gonna release at the end of, in a couple of slides and show you is some code that actually does this, okay? Um, so this is kind of the workflow that we're gonna follow. Um, we use local entropy, and then when we want more, we just seed the entropy. Uh, in the, from, from our entropy pool into the random number generator. And then once we run low on bits, we ask IBM Q for, some, for a load of qubits, and then we get them. Now, the circuit we use is really simple. If you remember, I said that we use the Hadamard gate to go to superposition. Superposition means you have equal probability of being a one or a zero. That's what it means, right? So if you do a Hadamard rotation and you go into superposition, that's the same thing as a U2 rotation, which is why that's what you're seeing in the circuit. Quantum computers don't implement the theoretical gates. They always transpile into what the gates are actually available on the system. So what I worked out was that actually I could, on the larger machines, the IBM uh, Q machine in Melbourne has 15 available qubits. Um, and you can run up to 8,192 individual shots, which means I can get 8,192 multiplied by 15 bits of output. Okay, and then I can go, right, I've now got 122,880 potential random bits. Now, the problem is they're not secret to me, but they're very good, high quality random. So if I blend them with the local sources of randomness, I get something kind of cool. So 
I've just made a little gist with a little kind of uh, Python class just to show you. Um, let me pull up some code. Like I can demonstrate that it actually runs. It, uh, uh, if I don't actually do that, actually run the code, it helps, I suppose. Uh, let me just shrink this down. So this is just going to be generating things. Um, you'll see that in a second when it gets rolling, it's going to add a job. So it's going to go, oh, look, I've got all these random bits. Oh, I need to run a, run a background IBM Q process. And if I look at the results here, if I just refresh this page, then you can see it's added uh, this job. Here we go, just a few seconds ago. And it's going to run in 15 minutes, so long after I am off the stage, uh, long halfway through uh, Chris's talk. Um, but like, yeah, they, that will actually run. And then it, if I leave this running, it will see directly into it. QR code here for those who want to play along at home. What does the code look like? It's just Python. So I coded in um, the Blum Blum Shub, real name, the Blum Blum Shub uh, CSPRNG, and I coded it all in, a few dirty hacks here and there, sorry. This is not for production. If you put this in production, that's a silly thing to do. But I know that this is a good random number generator, so I am just sort of implementing it kind of haphazardly that I have not taken any care or consideration in this. This is all proof of concept to show that I can have a background process that deals with IBM Q, as you can see here. So I make the circuit, I run the circuit, I get the bits, I do some hashing because Ketchak 3 is actually really, really useful um, to be able to sort of say, look, I take the entropy pool, which is my local secrecy, I take the really high quality randomness, quality randomness courtesy of IBM Q, and I just hash the two together and I just do that over and over again for all the bits. I then do another one at the end just because I can, and it adds a little bit more entropy to the whole system. And then it just keeps going round and round. All I'm doing here is I'm just generating billions of bits, okay? And you can see the output here is uh, throwing out numbers every 8,192 bits, I think. And that's, that's, that's the code. This actually works. I've had this running on a system for a couple of days, and it ran just fine. Absolutely fine. No problems, no issues. It just kept going. So like this is perfectly workable. The, the, the IBM system works perfectly fine. If you want to have a look, I put loads of comments in to explain what I'm doing and why, and also why you shouldn't use this in production. I cannot stress this enough. But like, yeah, it, it works and it's there. And if you want to have a play, there's a worked example of how you can use quantum algorithms to do something that's kind of nifty. So I'm going to sort of put the fin slide up and say thank you very much. I'm gonna end it there and I'm gonna uh, entertain whatever questions you have. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you, Dr. Mark Clan, Carney. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, you got a lot of good comments here. I'm gonna see if there's any questions in them uh, besides more cow math from when, you know. Uh, more cow math, yeah, that, that goes with the cowbell. Um, you know, actually, cow is the name of, I think, cow is the name of a quantum key distribution system. I actually think that's right. I'll check that. I'll check that. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you got one. Uh, give the quantum computer a limit to solve then. Where's this? Uh, that was actually in Discord. I, don't I was know in Discord. Was in, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know what part of your speech it was at, but... Um. I don't know. I mean, quantum computers are really useful. Like, um, I think that at the moment they're small. Like they are like, they're sub ZX80s, right? So actually, if you're going to start learning how things are going and learning what to do, now is actually a pretty good time because Qiskit documentation is thorough. If you don't remember your high school two by two matrices, they've got a really nice page in line for the page you're trying to read and understand. It's all there. So actually, Qiskit's got a lot of really good documentation. Um, and I think that actually you can um, have a lot of, uh, uh, of, of fun with these things just by playing around with things. Actually, having a 16 qubit, well, 15 qubit computer from, um, from IBM available is kind of really handy. You can do Shaw's algorithm to factor the number 17. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess there's no other questions. I'll give them like, a couple more cents for anyone who has other questions or if Wynn has another comment he wants to make. <laughs> I'm sure he'll. I, I, I'm. I'm sure we, we just we just listen for, on the wind, and uh, we will uh, we will hear him uh, on the fourth with. I'm very. Oh, we got one. Uh, can you share quantum break timeline again? Quantum break timeline. Yes. Let me find that slide for you. So uh, fundamentally, uh, the assumptions I've made here 
I get rid of the Q&A. Um, the assumptions I've made here are that we currently have about two to the six qubits in one machine. That's about, we got 53. So, you know, kind of nearby. Um, if we assume doubling every year, so it's going to go from two to the six, then next year, two to the seven, then two to the eight and two to the nine. Okay. It's just going to go up iteratively. So like a really, really fast Moore's law because Moore's law was 18 months, wasn't it? So like we know the thresholds are breaking like RSA. So we know how many qubits we need. So like you just keep multiplying until you've got enough. Okay. And then you go, it's, it's at least, at least seven years. It's at least eight years, but that's making huge assumptions about engineering and physics. Realistically, you're going to be talking 10 to 15 years, but like, you know, like the iPhone is 15 years old next year. Okay. Like it's, it's, it, it, it'll go quite quickly. I think uh, there's a lot of money being plumbed into this. There's a lot of people looking at this, at these problems. So I think there's a, a high chance that we might see things, some things a little sooner, some things a little later. We'll just have to see how it goes. But there's the, there's the slide I think that people were after. All right, great. Uh, I don't see any more questions in any place. So I think you're all set. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you very much, Corncon. I've really enjoyed it. Take care. Yeah, hopefully see you next year. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Um, next up at uh, 3.30, we're going to have Chris Roberts. He's a geek hacker, and he's at Hillbilly Hit Squad. He's going to talk to you about all your votes are belonged to. Uh, it should be a good talk. Uh, talk to you soon. Bye, guys.